This is just a pictorial view of the anatomy <laughs> because all of you are now using endoscopes. So you are familiar with the anatomy. But to have a three dimensional picture in your mind is important. I will not speak much, I will just show you different images from different aspects. So you can have a form an idea in your mind that when you insert the ventricle, what you are going to expect. So it is important when you are operating upon a ventricular anatomy, especially when you insert the ventricle, everything looks you are in a cavity. So unless you have in your mind an idea about where you are, you get lost. It is very easy to get lost in the ventricle. So just go through these pictures and try to find a sort of a three dimensional idea about what structure you are dealing with. So this things uh, these are all taken from different textbooks which you have already seen somewhere and all. So I do not need to speak much. This is a side section, this is a superior view of the various structures you have already seen in a different colored format. Same thing, I will just spend some time so you can have an idea about what you are looking at when you enter the ventricle. You see this anatomy differs the different sections. These are the sectional anatomy at A, B, C and D. The temporal horn, occipital horn, middle of the body, the frontal horn and how it looks different. When you enter the ventricle, it may not be endoscope in the while you are doing a transcalosal approach, interhemispheric. Sometimes it is very easy to get confused which ventricle you are in, right or left. So therefore, you have to add an idea about how to identify right or left you are in the right or left. So this will help you in that thing. Same thing, this is a superior view. So the structures which can help you identify where you are, two important structures. One is the choroid plexus, other is the veins. Okay, choroid plexus always leads you to the foramen of Monroe, and then the veins. The major vein is on the lateral wall of the ventricle. When you talk about subcoroidal, this, this is the choroid plexus. So this is attached to here somewhere. This is the lateral ventricle going to the third ventricle. This you have to dissect here. You have to retract this lateral, this choroid plexus, and then go. But most of the times we are not using those approaches. So this is how it looks like. The same thing, the different recesses where you already infundibular recess, lamina terminalis, the chiasma. This is the endoscopic view of the infundibular recess, mammillary bodies and where you make a third ventriculostomy. This is how it looks like. It looks better <laughs> in the pictures than in the grouse. I do not know why, but it looks better in the pictures. It is the same thing, huh? vagal trigon, hypoglossal trigon, the area postrema, sulcus limitans, facial colliculus. Okay. This anatomy which you have already seen has to determine the, uh, decide the approaches to the ventricle. This is from Roton. You see when you enter the lateral ventricle, where you want to enter depends upon which tumor or which areas you want to approach. Commonly approaches used for entering the lateral ventricle will all of you are using here. One is the interhemispheric approach, other is through the middle frontal gyrus and the frontal lawn through the frontal lawn. Mm -hmm. The choice of approach you will have to decide depending on the where the maximum projection of the tumor is and your and more important than your familiarity with the approach you are using. Okay. So lateral ventricle normally we enter into the frontal horn either by interhemispheric approach, usually anterior and or through the middle frontal gyrus. What is the problem when you are entering the anti-hemispheric approach is you have to be careful about the bridging veins. Sometimes your ideal craniotomy may not be possible because the bridging veins come into view. So that will determine your approach into anti-hemispheric and sometimes because of there are so many veins you may have to abandon the procedure because if you damage those veins you can have problems. So that is important. You see what is the importance? So once you open the temporal horn and see the choroidal plexus that leads to the choroidal fissure. And you have to open that fissure and once you open that fissure, you have reached your medial limit of the hippocampus. Okay, you know if you go beyond that, you are likely to damage perforators from coming to the posterior communicating artery. This is important to know the choroidal fissure. Other important thing known about choroidal fissure is do not retract superior to the choroidal fissure. If you retract, you will do damage what section? That area. Thalmus lies there. So do not retract there or be very gentle at it. So this is why you should know where the choroidal fissure lies. So this is your medial limit. You have to open the arachnoid there and this is, and then try to enucleate the hippocampus from all the sides. This is what is being done here, the same thing I have shown you. If you breach this arachnoid, then you see these vessels. So idea is to know these vessels are there and not breach the arachnoid once you are doing it. But this is only for people who are doing epilepsy surgery or you are operating with tumors in the medial temporal lobe. And the same thing what I talked about is being shown in this way. So choroidal fissure is an important landmark. It must is important to know what is safe. Beyond this is unsafe. This is what epilepsy surgery we are talking about. So these things are just uh, various ways of entering. I mean, there are so many avenues, which will uh, this will dis depend upon what pathology we are dealing with. So there is nothing much to be discussed about it. So you can enter into ventricle from various ways. So you have to know what is the safe area of, uh, depending upon the tumor or the lesion you are approaching, 
and what is the venous anatomy in this area. So, these are the all commonly used approaches for anterior ventricle are either a frontal as a like this or like this or sometimes in the temporal horn, we are talking about the lateral ventricle. This is the same thing shown in a different way and sometimes when you are not going into hemispheric or to the middle frontal gyrus, you can do sometimes transcycle also depending on where the tumor is pointing. This is anterior interhemispheric. Posterior interhemispheric nowadays is rarely used. I mean the, the classical transclosal approach posterior is rarely used nowadays except for that pineal region tumors. It is not used for entering to the ventricles nowadays most of the times. Is the anterior interhemispheric approach or the transventricular approach? Sometimes yes. Sometimes to enter into the to in the temporal horn, you especially on the non-dominant side, you may have to do a, a small anterior temporal lobectomy also. Sometimes it's safer to do a lobectomy rather than retracting that if you want to enter the temporal horn and non-dominant side. For approaching this area of the brain, this is the posterior part, and sometimes your lesions are in the medial part of the occipital lobe. So the posterior interhemispheric is occasionally used for this thing. But the advantage of the occipital lobe is there are hardly any bridging veins there. So, that makes your job easier. So, anatomy of the third ventricle you have already seen. Normally, most of the times we enter the third ventricle through foramen of Monroe. You enter into one or other the lateral ventricle and then enter through the foramen of Monroe. Okay, because most of the times when we are entering the foramen of Monroe, we are entering in a pathological situation where it is already enlarged. Okay. But ideally, if we are doing an ideal approach with there is no distortion or anatomy, the ideal position of entering the third ventricle will be through the septal pseudum. If you are able to remain strictly in the midline, you will be like this. You are septum pellucidum. You will not be opening each lateral ventricle, going through the septum pellucidum and entering to the roof of the, then you reach the roof of the third ventricle. Then you do an inter fornicial approach and enter to the third ventricle. This is the most least invasive, but for that it is usually not possible in pathologies because there is a distortion. You usually enter one of the lateral ventricles, then through the foramen of Monroe, enter into the third ventricle. The many procedures described how to enlarge third ventricle. I usually do not do enlarge. If you have to think you have to enlarge, you have to change your approach because you may damage the fornix or damage the one of veins. If the, it is not already enlarged with the tumor, it is better not to try to enlarge it artificially by cutting. I know it is in the textbooks they may describe you enter in the posterior part as you cut it, but it is always better to avoid it. Possible. So, this you decide depending on where the tumor is pointing and your experience whether you want to go transclosal or transcortical. These are just uh, showing a, a diagram of DTI images, showing different tracks. There is more for fun rather than for a practical use. But I mean, at present, I am not using these things for planning my surgery. It may be helpful for people who are using DTI regularly in planning their approach and doing interoperative monitoring of the tracks and all those things. So, this is again the pros and cons of each approach. This is the same thing as I said. The artery, then you, you can enter here or here or here. Sometimes you cannot decide after you enter, you will be then trying to decide which your side you have entered. Then the choroid plexus and the thermostat will help you. And ideally, if possible, it is very beautiful. So, once in a while, out of uh, 4 or 5 times, you will enter into the middle. Then if you see such a beautiful anatomy here. If you are very happy to see, then if you want, you can enter both the sides. So, if you remaining in the midline is uh, an art, and you want to enter, go into the midline, you will feel much happier and you will have a better anatomical view of what you are doing. Sometimes you see both the ventricles, then you it can be retrospect. You see both the ventricles, then you identify the midline. So, this is just the same things again. For example, I mean the theoretically or even practically sometimes left side is better view from the right side. But in generally, I will always like to plan from a non-dominant side because that uh, the extent of the tumor always determines your approach. But it is uh, you have a better view across tangential view. So, the left this side tumor is better seen from this side. This is the standard. The incisions, uh, I am not very strict about the which incision uh, ideally should be. That is your decision. Some people use this incision, some will use a small incision, some people, I mean, that is your decision. But in general, this is a standard description for a, a bicoronal incision for a transclosal approach. And of course, uh, your angle, uh, this is endoscopic, these are the different uh, what I was talking about. So, so many incisions we used. So, this is no right or wrong, what I am saying. There is no right incision or wrong incision. This is the area is broader. This this may be you can may have a craniotomy like this also. You can have a craniotomy like this, you can have a craniotomy like this. So, you do not need any exposure here. Only exposure you need is here, and this length is determined by your veins. The determinant of this length is veins. And nowadays, initially, you make one borehole, 
either you make mid borehole or if contralateral borehole or two boreholes but nowadays because everybody is using drill on me one or two boreholes is sufficient but even now even when i am using drills and microtome sometimes i make two or three boreholes in the midline safety is always better sometimes if you have a large i would prefer to make two or three boreholes on the midline or across the way rather than have a damage to the side and sinus so that is not a concern the common approach which is using and these are just what i talk about you can leave this main along with the dura huh? you can leave this strip of dura open the door here and then you can find corridors and uh, have patience if you have patience once the csf starts coming out coming out you will get enough space so i think corpus callosum god made only for neurosurgeons to split so we keep on splitting the corpus callosum and going <laughs> where so many procedures we do by splitting the corpus so this is the same thing seen from different points of and one must always so be aware that we, all of us have seen fornix as a single thick bundle sometimes there are variations in anatomy of the fornix also fornix can be flat it may not always be a bundle it may be flat so be aware that whenever you are trying to do subcoroidal or interfornix approach there can be variation in anatomy so have a look at the mri before if you are planning to do that to specialize approach is subcoroidal or interfornix the anatomy in various views i mean in endoscopic anatomy and uh, gross anatomy this is a subcoroidal approach we talked about huh thermostat vein choroidal this is the subcoroidal approach and this is that uh, sitting position you use sitting position for this approach for lesions which are small and below the tentorial edge okay because this is the area where the veins are usually superior so this is supposedly a better a vascular avoiding the veins of the vein of gallen and all those things and the only thing which you have to keep in mind about this approach is the arachnoid here is different from the arachnoid any other place in the brain arachnoid is very thick here so you have to be careful while opening the arachnoid you may damage some veins because the arachnoid area is very thick even normally i am very fond of this approach because i think this is the best approach for posterior third ventricular region that you have to decide because this gives you maximum access you can cut the tentorium you can cut the fox and have a full approach access i i prefer this for most of the posterior third ventricular tumors which need surgery to an open approach there are two positions described one is the park bench or lateral position with the operative side down and this prone this is the standard description of this position So you made a craniotomy on the down side so that the lobe falls away. But some people, including me, prefer a prone position, and you can tilt the table, tilt the table to one side, and it's easier to make that position easier for the patient, for the anesthetist, and for the surgeon. I am a personal uh, advocate of a prone position for this thing because we have good tables. You fix the patient, and then you turn one side, and you cut the tentorium to have a view at the along the straight sinus, parallel to straight sinus. You have a view below the tentorium, and if required, you can cut the fox. and see the lesion of the side so fourth ventricle you can either enter the fourth ventricle by splitting the vermis or if the lesion is more inferiorly you can just tilo vela you can just uh, without opening just inferior medullary vellum is there you follow the vellicula the lift of the tonsils and enter the tumor but sometimes in medulloblastomas when you have large tumors it may not be possible to do it it's better there's no harm in splitting the vermis just trying to go and uh, damaging and necessarily also not required but most often this is okay now this is the second uh, the transfer image is routine here so i'll just show you anatomy endoscopic anatomy that this is how it looks like all of you have seen this this is a diagrammatic representation of what it looks like mammillary bodies in fundibular recess the floor of third ventricular same views so and point of etv nice etv done 